Over Bowling Green State University's most recent J-term, I spent two weeks studying abroad in Costa Rica. Prior to leaving for the trip, I decided that I would use Costa Rica and their policies to examine how and why immigration policies are seemingly becoming stricter. Costa Rica offered interesting insights as they are one of the most stable countries in the Central American re region. Therefore, I studied their policies and then compared them to those of the United States to gain a deeper insight into some of the factors that may be contributing to more stringent immigration policies. So the first important aspect to look at when examining a country's immigration policy is to first look at the history of how it's changed. So I started in Costa Rica in 1986, and this was the year that they had really started restricting immigration. Uh, this was the year they passed the Alien and Migration Act. And this was an attempt to restrict illegal immigration to Costa Rica. Now, the problem was that um, a little over 10 years later in 1998, Hurricane Mitch made landfall in Latin America, and Nicaragua and Honduras were two of the hardest hit countries. And so in 1999, Costa Rica actually issued amnesty, making it easier for Nicaraguans to acquire residency status due to the fact that many of them had fled to Costa Rica to flee the devastating effects that Hurricane Mitch had had on their country. Um, and then on November 9th, 1999, the president of Costa Rica offered all Central Americans living within the country the opportunity, opportunity to file for permanent residency status, which again was directly related to Hurricane Mitch having hit the country uh, the year prior. Uh, Costa Rica, throughout history has been known as being uh, typically pretty accepting of immigrants. And so this wasn't all that surprising that the first restrictive policy didn't last necessarily that long when there was uh, a disaster and a reason for people to be fleeing their countries. Uh, now in 2005, uh, we began to see uh, the strict policies coming back into place when the government passed the General Law of Migration and Alien Affairs. Um, and one of my sources of information, um, a quote from Caitlin Forot um, in one of her articles, said that this policy framed immigration in terms of criminality and national security, focusing on repressive police measures that some human rights groups argued violated the Costa Rican Constitution an international treaty signed by Costa Rica. So historically speaking, this was one of the most restrictive policies that the country had ever seen. Um, and there was a lot of backlash following the institution, which I'll actually be talking about on the next slide. Um, this policy was so restrictive that in 2010, it was revised um, and a new version of the law went into place to kind of counter balance how strict this policy was in the country. Now to backtrack a little bit, I think it's important to look at what the policies were like before this extremely stringent policy was enacted in 2005. And so in one of Caitlin Forot's articles, she actually says that strict policies made more lenient by amnesty showed a tradition of hospitality and refuge for displaced populations from Latin America. Now, again, I touched on this a little bit in the previous slide. There was an immigration law enacted in the 1980s that was stricter than any other policy ever put in place in Costa Rica. But again, when Hurricane Michael hit the country, the countries of Honduras and Nicaragua, these amnesties came into play that allowed those citizens to come to Costa Rica and to gain citizenship. And so before these two, this 2005 law, Costa Rica was very welcoming of displaced peoples from whatever it may have been. And so they were very welcoming of political refugees and environmental refugees. But again, in 2005, this new policy came into place, but it was extremely strict. And a lot of citizens didn't necessarily agree with the things that it was putting into place in Costa Rica. And when President Oscar Arias was elected to the presidency in Costa Rica, he actually described this 2005 law as draconian. 
and he wanted to see it replaced with something that was less strict towards immigrants. And so we actually saw this change in 2010, but there were still a lot of problems with the 2010 law that made it more strict towards immigrants um, because it kept in place the increased cost of residency applications, new restrictions on obtaining residency and increased border patrols, and while immigrants can still claim residency based on first degree family relation, this can be extremely difficult for low income immigrants. On the next slide, I'm going to touch on Nicaragua's history with Costa Rica and the people that are coming into the country. But the importance of these financial restrictions is that a lot of immigrants coming from Nicaragua are actually fleeing poverty rather than anything else. This has changed a little bit in the past couple of years with some political unrest but overall, most immigrants come to escape poverty. And so when we enact these strict financial regulations, it can be extremely difficult for immigrants to live within Costa Rica as legal immigrants. And along with this, this also goes back to the OECD report from 2018 that says that a lot of these immigrants that are coming into Costa Rica are actually coming in on legal temporary visas, and they have the intention of obtaining uh, temporary residency. But again, even with this 2010 law, it becomes difficult to pay the, in US dollars, $200 required to apply for this status. And so even with some of these stringent regulations from the 2000 law, 2005 law taken out, the financial restrictions still in place make it extremely difficult for Nicaraguan immigrants to live within the country of Costa Rica legally. One may be questioning that I've related a lot of these immigration policies back to Nicaraguan immigrants specifically, and there is a reasoning behind that. Uh, the reason is that all research points to increasing restrictions being directly related to the Costa Rican government wanting to cut down on the amount of Nicaraguan immigrants coming into the country. And this is why so much of the research surrounds Nicaraguan immigration into Costa Rica. There are some questions as to why these policies are focused specifically at Nicaraguans, and it's likely because uh, Nicaraguans make up approximately 8% of Costa, Rica, Costa Rica's entire population. And this statistic makes them the largest immigrant group in the country. And along with this, they also represent the largest population of undocumented immigrants. And so relating back to the previous slide again, research by Catherine Marquette points to abject poverty being the main reason Nicaraguans flee Nicaragua for, for Costa Rica. Although in 2018, there was some political unrest within Nicaragua. And this led to another large influx of immigrants fleeing to Costa Rica. And so when we look at immigration policy in Costa Rica, it is extremely important to realize that many of the policies being put in place and a lot of the controversy surrounding what the country should do when it comes to immigration policy directly relates to Costa Ricans' views of the Nicaraguan immigrant population within the country. And so again, Costa Rica's history with Nicaraguans is extremely important to their immigration policy. Once I finished looking into the history of Costa Rica's immigration policies, as well as their background when it came to Nicaraguan immigrants, I realized that the fears surrounding immigration extended far beyond Costa Rica. They extended far beyond the United States. And so the question really became, why? This has really become a worldwide issue, one that it seems that we haven't necessarily been faced with on such a large scale in our world's history. And so the factors I examined in my specific research while comparing Costa Rican immigration policy to that of the United States were economic fears, the policy debate and how it was portrayed in the media, a sense of nationalism in one's country, and the social welfare systems that are in place in each country. So I examined these factors specifically because they're such hot topics and they're things that you often hear about in why immigration should be restricted. And so I looked at if I looked at these reasons 
wondering if they were the main things really leading to stricter immigration policies across the world. When I began looking into the reasons as to why immigration policies were becoming stricter in Costa Rica, I started with what I believe to be the most well-known argument for why a country should restrict immigration flows into their countries. And that, were, that was based on economic fears. Now, according again to Mary uh, Malone, over the past two decades, Costa Rica has implemented major economic reforms that have liberalized markets, but also increased economic uncertainties. Income inequality and unemployment rose substantially between 1990 and 2012, and many Costa Ricans began to feel that the hallmarks of the middle class living were out of their grasp. And so, again, many Costa Ricans feeling this sense that the middle class was kind of slipping out of their reach was a really important economic factor to consider when looking at immigration policy. And that's because Costa Rica is considered one of the most stable countries in the Central American region. And they really pride themselves on this image within the world community. And so as the citizens began to feel a sense that this way of living wasn't as possible as it, as it had always been, they, be kind, they kind of began to look for someone to blame for this. And so studies have shown that it is much easier to blame immigrants for this economic downturn than it is to blame anyone within your country or even within your own government. And so this is actually found in the competitive threat theory. And this is when I looked at the United States because I felt that they were an extremely great example to compare Costa Rica's immigration policy to because I felt that this was something the United States also had gone through. And so there was research conducted into the competitive threat theory. And this specific research that I focused on looked at the United States and what happened um, in the 2008 recession. And so this theory claims that harsh economic conditions can lead people to perceiving immigrant groups as threats to them and their livelihoods. And this is because there's a sense of strong competition for resources resources which become more scarce during times of economic downturns. And so in the research conducted by two researchers by the last names of Kwok and Wallace actually found that many of the aspects of the competitive threat theory fit what happened in the United States in 2008 during the recession. And then we can also look much earlier in the United States um, in a separate study conducted by Douglas Massey and Karen Pren, who looked at the post-1965 surge from Latin America um, and the unintended consequences of the United States immigration policy. And they talked about how economic inequality led to the passage of the Quota Acts of 1921 and 1924, which essentially just reduced the number of immigrants allowed to come to the United States. And so um, going back to Wallace and Clock's research to still support this idea that economic downturn does lead to more stringent uh, immigration policies. Uh, people in countries that suffered more severely during the Great Recession in 2008 were much more likely to perceive immigrants as threats. And again, to combine these two research articles in the United States, uh, I attempted to show that during times of economic downturn, like Costa Rica had been experiencing, um, immigration policies often become much stricter because immigrants become seen as a threat to those of natural citizens because there's not as many jobs because the economy is in a downward spiral. So when we apply this theory to Costa Rica, uh, contrary to many other countries, little research actually exists uh, regarding immigrants' impacts on their economy. And so this has created a little bit of a gap in policymaking uh, because without a great understanding of immigration's effects on an economy, um, it's difficult to create policies that are um, fair in the eyes of those being most affected by them. Um, but an economic study conducted by a, uh, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development in Costa Rica found that immigrants were actually fairly well integrated into the labor force. Um, and their participation was approximately between 8 and 10 percentage points higher than those of the native-born population. Um, 
Contrary to this, immigrants have lower levels of education than native-born Costa Ricans, which goes back to the fact that many immigrants coming to Costa Rica are fleeing poverty and likely did not have as many educational opportunities as those compared to those um, of native-born Costa Ricans. Um, Nicaraguans in Costa Rica also have earnings, lo earnings lower than those of native-born workers, which could be a result in this large gap in attained education. Uh, despite this, um, the research also found that immigrants contribute pretty positively to economic growth. And while they're frequently re overrepresented in low income sectors, they contribute between 11.1% and 11.9% of the value added in Costa Rica. So um, just as a counter argument to this, um, and to pay tribute to those who believe that immigrants do hurt the economy, it is important to note that um, this same study in 2013 did find that immigrants paid less in taxes than native-born Costa Ricans. And so this kind of presents them to those who know this, that they're having a much greater burden for public finance than the native-born population. Um, this is often due to a variety of factors. Uh, they have less education, they're working lower income jobs, they're contributing less in tax revenue, and so then they become begin to be seen as that economic burden. Uh, but along with this, the OECD said that the economic downturn in 2013 in Costa Rica would have happened regardless of whether or not immigrants would have been there. The actual research states such cost, including debt service and defense expenditure, would probably not decrease if all immigrants were to leave the country. Immigrants paid more in taxes than they generated in additional public expenditures. So despite the fact that they paid less in taxes, they're still generating more in that than they are in their additional public expenditures by being there. So again, what I found when it came to economic fears was it wasn't necessarily that immigrants were an economic burden more so than it was this fear surrounding the fact that they may be an economic burden. And that leads to much more stringent policies, even if the research doesn't support that. The second large factor that I looked at regarding the immigration policy debate was how it's portrayed in the media and the influence that the media can really have on different policies being passed in both the United States and Costa Rica. And so I was extremely excited to look at whether or not Costa Rica had similar circumstances surrounding the media and its influence because having lived in the United States and grown up here, I obviously knew that the media played an extremely large role in policy being passed in the United States and policy dissemination. Um, and most recently, in the 2016 presidential election, when Donald Trump really used media outlets to his advantage, both to demonize them and to get others on his side. And so I began by looking at the United States, and I found research published in the Brookings Institute in 2008. And while this looked specifically at the United States, I felt that Perhaps some of it could also relate back to what I may find in Costa Rica. And so this specific report found that when immigration is associated with crime, crisis, or controversy, it more often makes news. And so obviously this is playing an extremely large role in the United States, especially during presidential administrations when the president in office is in favor of stricter immigration policies. And so we saw this in the United States under President Ronald Reagan, who was in favor of much stricter immigration policies. And so during his time in office, he would often frame illegal immigration as a question of national security. And so it was using this type of language that really gave people in the United States kind of a feeling of need to create stricter immigration policies because again the language used was really kind of creating fear for what would happen if there weren't stricter immigration policies and then political advantages were often thought to be gained by demonizing latino immig immigrants and illegal migration and again 
going back to the research found in the Brookings Institute, by demonizing the Latino immigrants, they were more likely to make news because they were more likely to show only the bad acts that had happened by these specific people rather than all of the good they may have also been doing. And so this same trend was seen in 2006 in Costa Rica when I began looking into whether or not they face similar cir circumstances regarding the media. And so what I found was that in Costa Rica, the media also emphasized that the country was being flooded, bombarded, and invaded by illegal immigrants. And again, this relates back to the same thing that we've seen in the United States. When you use that threatening and fear enticing language, it's more likely to make the media and it's more likely to be seen during administrations that are much more in favor of stricter immigration policies. And so then we saw the exact same thing in Costa Rica. These politicians that were in favor of these more stringent immigration policies began claiming that immigrants were a threat to national security, which again, we've seen this in the United States. And so I was extremely interested to see that the two countries were actually extremely similar in the things that we were seeing in the media. And Costa Rica also used this to their advantage in kind of demonizing the Nicaraguan immigrants. Um, Caitlin Fora in her writing said that in Costa Rica, the urgency and magnitude of Nicaraguan immigrant threats were reproduced and disseminated through television and print media. And again, that's when media began using those words such as flooded, bombarded, and invaded. And I think the most interesting thing when comparing both the United States and Costa Rica is that they are both democratic societies. And so when you have these media outlets that are more likely to show news stories that see immigrants in a bad light because the um, negative aspects of certain things that they may have done are more likely to be dramatized then the public perception can play a huge role in the policies being implemented. And so when only negative information is disseminated, then it's more likely that more stringent policies are going to be, be, going to be made in the countries. And so I think this was extremely interesting research and there was so much information regarding the media in both countries, but I found such similarities in the influence that the media can have. And so I found that this was one of the largest factors into how immigration policies can change, whether that be positive, positively or negatively. And so I most definitely had to include the media and its influence because it's seen in both the United States and Costa Rica, and it has such a large influence on the public perception, which in turn leads to different policies being put in place within democratic societies. I've included this graph that was found in the article titled Unintended Consequences of U.S. Immigration Policy, explaining the post-1965 surge from Latin America. And this goes along with the uh, portrayal of immigrants in the media. And so I've added this just to show how much our language has changed regarding immigration in the media. And so you can see uh, this figure is examining the pairing of the term flood, crisis, or invasion with Mexico or Mexican immigrants to, in four leading U.S. newspapers. And this is from 1965 through 1995, so it's not extremely recent, but I think it shows um, how important and how much of an influence the media can have on a democratic country. And that's because as we see these words being used more frequently in the media, if we attach those years to specific policy, we would find that these are years with more stringent policies, but more often this negative language is being used. And so I just included this to show that while this trend is in the United States, it's also found in Costa Rica. The next aspect that I looked at was extremely relevant to the country of Costa Rica, and that was their social welfare programs. So Costa Rica has been known for having an extremely generous social welfare program, including a nationalized healthcare system. More important than this, its citizens 
strongly support the government and their role to provide these services to the citizens of the country. And so Costa Rica is actually one of the oldest social welfare states in the hemisphere. And again, that relates back to the support that its citizens give to the government in providing services. And according to Mary Malone's article and her research, security, health services, and education were areas of considerable consensus among citizens. And at least 65% of those that responded to her survey supported the government provision of these services. And so this creates an extremely interesting dynamic when we look at how immigration plays a role in social welfare programs and vice versa. So when we relate social welfare programs to immigration policy, what's important to realize and what is brought up by Caitlin Forot in one of her articles is that by having a social welfare program in whatever country you may be in, the discussion is no longer just about border patrol and visa controls, but it becomes more about who has access to the systems being offered in whichever country we may be discussing. So when we discuss Costa Rica, in 1999, when President Rodriguez granted citizenship to other Central Americans living within the country of Costa Rica, those immigrants then gained access to the health care and education benefits that were offered by the Costa Rican government because they were then Costa Rican citizens. And so again, it's more about who is deserving of what services within a country. And it's made the debate much more difficult within Costa Rica. So while uh, Malone has found that citizens are very supportive of government provision of these services, that same study also found that people became less supportive of government attempts to reduce income inequality if immigrants were perceived to be threats. And so we can tie this back to the economic fears that I discussed on the previous slide, because since 2011, the Costa Rican security, Social Security Fund has faced financial troubles. And this has made it increasingly difficult to maintain these social programs that the government has always been able to offer its citizens. Along with that, there's also been a decline in the quality of healthcare given within the Costa Rican nationalized healthcare system. And so, of course, as I've discussed, uh, Nicaraguans are often portrayed as being the reason that these systems are deteriorating. Uh, within the media, they're, just, uh, they're kind of shown as being criminals who are only in the countries to take advantage of these systems. Uh, they're also typically blamed for the deterioration in services, saying that they're a burden within the economy and they're not contributing as much as Costa Rican citizens. And so these social welfare programs, which are such a sense of pride, which gain so much support among Costa Rican citizens, are be becoming a point of contention within the country of Costa Rica. And it's really creating the debate of who should be allowed to have access to these services and how much should they be contributing to ensure that they are having access to the education system and the healthcare system. And so this just makes the debate that much more difficult and it's made it extremely difficult in Costa Rica and the debate within the media and within the country is just raging. The last factor that I examined was one that I found to be the most interesting. And that's that there's a sense of nationalism that exists both within Costa Rica and the United States. For Costa Rica, this ties back to the fact, again, that they are one of the most stable democratic regions in Central America. And among Costa Ricans, they've kind of established a sense of exceptionalism. They really pride themselves on being that stable democratic country that's able to compete on a world stage. And they pride themselves on that image of being a country that people can go to in a country that uh, other countries can trade with. And so to many Costa Ricans, stereotypes regarding na Nicaraguan immigrants often create a negative mark on these things that Costa Ricans pride themselves on. 
And this overall is tied to this idea that Costa Ricans have been known to see themselves as whiter than other Central American citizens. And so, for example, while Nicaraguans are seen as inherently violent, Costa Ricans view themselves as peaceful. And while they see Nicaraguans as poor and illiterate, they see themselves as middle class and educated. And tying back to the sense of whiteness, while Costa Ricans view themselves as white, Nicaraguans are mestizo and dark skin. And so overall, this creates a seeming threat to the Costa Rican national identity and this reputation of exceptionalism that it's created for itself. And so one of the most important things about this dynamic is that the distinction between Nicaraguans and Costa Ricans constructs what researcher Theodore Twidwell calls a sense of a foreign other. And so Twidwell writes that the Nicaraguan other, an other which in the Costa Rican national imagination is inherently less civilized, less educated, more brown, more indigenous, more black. In fact, within Costa Rica, Nicaraguans have imagined have been imagined as a distinct race and one inferior to white Costa Ricans. And so the most important thing about this distinction that has been created in Costa Rica is that this sense of foreign other that is placed on Nicaraguans allows for blame to be placed on Nicaraguans, which in turn leads to more, leads to more stringent policies. So if you're putting blame on somebody that you don't truly understand, a foreign other, it's much easier to create these more stringent policies and to blame these people because there's this image in your mind that they're completely distinct from you. And this is kind of the situation that Costa Rica's found themselves in because they've placed a sense of otherness on Nicaraguans and rather than a sense of personhood, it's made them a much easier target for the blame of a deteriorating economy and social welfare system. And so this sense of nationalism is actually extremely detrimental to what used to be a very welcoming country. And we've seen this as well in the United States. Uh, the U.S. national identity privileges the Eurocentric visions of America tied to race, language, and cultural origins. Researchers that have studied this same idea in the United States have found that Americans perceive themselves as having an American identity. And so researchers Michael Joan Coria, Helen B. Morrow, Dina G. Okamoto, and Linda R. Tropp actually say that scholars have found that U.S. born citizens often conceive, perceive of non-white immigrant newcomers as them rather than us. And this is reinforced by the psychological tendency to favor ones in group. And so the more ascriptively similar an immigrant is to that of a U.S. born citizen, born white in regard to race, the more likely they may eventually be accepted as American, as one of us, rather than as one of them. And so again, to tie these two back together, both the United States and Costa Rica hold a sense of nationalism in the superiority of their uh, countries. And by creating this sense of foreign other, this sense of there's us and there's them, it can be extremely detrimental to having any sense of a welcoming society to an immigrant population because if you create this identity around them that sees them as less than one, then the immigration policies are likely going to become much more stringent. So what I found overall was that a lot of questions still exist. There are many different layers of the immigration debate and why it is seemingly becoming much stricter. And so my main question was, do we truly understand why immigration policies are becoming stricter? Do we truly understand why we are making it harder for immigrants to come into our countries? And what the answer I came to was, perhaps, we do not. So some studies show that U.S. citizens who have more frequent contact with immigrants are more likely to have greater tendencies to welcome them, welcome them into the countries as well. Now, a study was conducted in Norway among Norwegian soldiers, 
And while this isn't in either country that I examined, it did support this finding that simply having interactions with immigrants really changes the perception of whether or not you agree with more stringent immigration policies. And so while I've examined the different factors that um, are often used to say um, why immigration policies are becoming stricter, the question I ended up left with was, are we more worried about a population of people that, do we, that we do not understand? Is our lack of understanding overall that's leading to these more stringent policies? And so, so while I was able to come up with some concrete factors and explanations for why immigration policies are becoming stricter, I think the overall answer that I came to was that with so many different layers and so many different uh, human interactions and so many different understandings is there's no one correct answer and there's still so much to study into why countries are creating more stringent immigration policies. To conclude, I was able to point to some concrete factors that can lead to countries implementing more stringent immigration policies. The ones I focused on throughout my research included economic fears, how immigration is portrayed in the media, a fear that immigrants within a country will overwhelm the country's social welfare programs, as well as a sense of nationalism and how immigrants can affect how a country is perceived on the world stage, as well as how they can change the stereotypical view of a citizen living within that country. As I pointed out on the last slide, while I was able to point to these concrete factors, I also found a lot more questions than what I anticipated while looking into the question of why countries are implementing more stringent immigration policies. I found that there was still a lot of research to be to be done, especially regarding the social factors that lead to these more stringent policies. So overall, I was able to point to these factors, but I think there are still a lot of underlying causes that are not yet established or completely understood as to why people within different countries are afraid of immigrants coming into their countries.